there we go, back to normal. Um, so I, it's, um, it's my great pleasure here to uh, give, I guess, the anniversary talk here and to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is subglacial geochemistry, which really is my, my research uh, specialization, if you will. And um, as you might have gathered from the title, I'm intending this to be a fairly general topic, so our review of the topic. So you might recognize your own work in some of the slides. So if, I hope to have cited everyone, but if not, uh, please um, accept my apologies in advance. And obviously I'm going to talk about some of my own work as well. So I'll, I'll acknowledge all my co-authors, students, collaborators, um, funding sources, et cetera, here at the beginning, um, which obviously I would not have been able to do all this work with, without um, many and varied support over the years. So I'll start here at the big, picture and that this being a map from the Randolph Glacial in Inventory, which is uh, the glaciers of the world. And I, I think about this as there being basically three glaciers in the world. One of them's here, it's Antarctica. One of them here, Greenland. And then the Alpine glaciers sort of being a third glacier that, that dons the high mountain peaks on basically every continent. Um, that might not be the most politically correct way to think about it, but, but that's sort of the paradigm um, I'm coming from, is looking at three separate glacial systems, Antarctica, Greenland, and the Alpine systems. And the, the main question we want to know it, for all of these, for any of this, is what is their major impact on the Earth's um, geochemical cycling? What um, are they doing? What, is the, what chemical processes are happening under ice? And then secondly, on what scale? Is this enough um, sulfur weathering to make a difference in the sulfur cycle? Is this enough uh, carbon sequestration to be relevant for global carbon cycles. So that's what I see as the, as the big picture questions for subglacial geochemistry, and also, of course, their feedbacks back into glacial until cycles and, and so on. But um, I'm going to look uh, at today's talk uh, mostly at chemical weathering products. And there's, there's a lot of exciting work that goes beyond that. So if you had, didn't get a chance to see it, please, um, watch the YouTube video of Martin Tranter, Mark Skidmore, and John Hawking's talk, because they talked some of about these other isotope tracer systems and, um, and the microbial uh, pathways looking at microbial communities. So there's a great deal of, of glacial work that I'm not going to include in this talk, but we're going to focus on a, uh, one tracer that I've been working with uh, recently. At, and then just looking simply at chemistry. Um, so these, these glaciers are sort of three ice body systems cover about 10% of the Earth's surface, but particularly the Alpine glaciers sort of throw outsized weight because they happen to be located at sites of high physical erosion. So anything they do chemically, they do to a place where there's lots of, of sediment passing through. So let me just give a few examples here. So this example of an alpine glacier is Hot Drolla, which is quite a famous alpine glacier, at least in the, in the glacial geochemistry um, world, because Sharp and Tranter, whose image um, from their book I, I took this from, and quite a few other people did um, several seasons of work here some decades ago, um, I think starting in the late, 80s, if I'm not mistaken, and going well through the 90s. And um, they, and it was um, a lot of what we know about um, glacial geochemistry really started with that body of work. And um, some things I'd like to point out about this glacier. So the ablation, or the accumulation zone is sort of back around this quarter, and the ablation zone is, is along the stretch you see in the photo. And it's, it's a, only about three kilometers long, um, this distance. And you can see 
that the area in which the ice is melting, the water is contacting the bed, chemical reactions are occurring at the bed, the solutes that dissolve from those chemical reactions are coming out in this stream. But this whole course is completely chalked with sediment. You have sediment coming down the sides of the mountain. You have this massive medial moraine. You have all this sediment at the bottom. So this is, and this is not true just of hot Drola. This is true of glacial, of the alpine glaciers in general, that they're, just, they're, that they're sediment through machines. Sediment is being pumped through these things and the waters also pass through them quite quickly. So the waters that have been characterized in these systems tend to be dilute relative to the size of the streams and they usually contain the weathering products of highly reactive minerals, usually carbonate and sulfate. So this is a sulfuric acid weathering of carbonates for the most part, even when these are silicate rich bedrock there's usually enough trace carbonate and sulfate that this is the dominant chemistry in these systems. And um, by contrast, Greenland, um, which is a, a place I've worked, but many other people have worked as well, um, is a much, much larger subglacial system. So here's, this is an Isunguata Sermia system where um, you have meltwater going to the bed and then coming out at a glacial terminus. But from where this moulin, the, this superglacial stream flows down this moulin and comes out, that's more like 45 kilometers. So this is, is, is more than an order of magnitude larger than, than a, a small alpine system. And um, that changes the nature of the chemistry both in that it's, you don't have the same sediment choke, sediment flux, flushing system. So the sediment has a much larger residence time underneath the glacier. And as a result, um, those highly reactive um, minerals are depleted. So it's still relatively uh, dilute water, but you have a larger role for carbonation weathering and for silicate weathering. So, so these, these glacial systems are distinct and it is because of, of, of their size in large part. Um, Gemma Wadham published a paper um, uh, about a decade ago which said um, chemical weathering or biogeochemical weathering under glacier size matters. And certainly when you compare a Greenland to the smaller alpine systems, it, it certainly does seem like size does matter um, for, for these meltwater driven systems. So Antarctica, on the other hand, while it's an even bigger size, it's a very different system. And what makes it so different is that there is no surface melt in, in nearly all of the continent. The only source of water is basal melt, and that is sourced by the, um, the uh, uh, geothermal heat and the strain heating under ice. And we're talking about at most a centimeter or two of melt per year. Um, in much of the continent, less than that, only a few millimeters. So this is um, a very different system because it has a lot less water and the water moves a lot more slowly. It is often stored in lakes, stored in tills, and, and, the, and makes its way off the continent, but at, at a much, much more leisurely pace because there's much less input of, of melt. Um, so I'll start with Antarctica and compare it back to Greenland and Alpine glacial systems. But um, Antarctic hydrochemical studies are a bit difficult to do because it's, it's hard to find the water. For the most part, the glaciers terminate in the sea and it's, you know, you, it's, it's hard to sub subglacial water in the sea. It gets diluted very quickly. So um, I know of three places on the continent where naturally emerging water has been sampled. If someone knows of other ones, let me know because these, this is the only ones I've been able to find. Um, the red star here is Blood Falls, the Taylor Glacier. The black star is Lewis Cliffs Ice Tongue. And the yellow star um, represents a eucalypt, which was an unusual event that happened near Casey's station, and they were able to characterize the waters therein. Um, and 
The other option is to, to drill for the water. And there's been quite a lot of work done here. The Pink Star, this is subglacial Lake Willens. They've also drilled into nearby subglacial Lake Mercer. Other subglacial Lake drilling campaigns are underway. So this is a, a major effort of the community presently. But I've only included the Willens data in this talk, although I've been told the Mercer data is similar, although I haven't seen the major element data published yet from that. These two blue stars, this was published by Mark Skidmore, uh, um, 2000, um, and others. And these, these are sediment pour waters from the um, Willens and Cam ice streams here. So these, these were samples of subglacial sediment, which then, the, which then they, they were able to extract the, the saturated water out of. And the, the final place that at least that I know of is is uh, Lake Untersee. Lake Untersee is actually a proglacial lake, but it's a permanently ice covered one. So um, it is considered that the water there has a, only as a subglacial origin because there's the ice cap doesn't allow meteoric water to, to, to reach. Um, so if we plot these on a, um, what this is called a Piper plot, this is the sort of data we get um, and not everyone here, I imagine, is a geochemist, so I'll just briefly explain this. So this is the major cations, the four most abundant cations, uh, plotted as a ternary diagram on this part of the plot, and the three most abundant anions on this part of the plot, this is chloride, sulfate, bicarbonate, and then these compositions are simply projected onto this discrimination diagram here. So pure sodium or potassium bicarbonate would plot down here and uh, pure magnesium or um, calcium sulfate or chloride would plot up here. So these two are collapsed. Um, and you will notice that the Antarctic waters with the exception of the Lake Untersea bottom waters tend to plot to the far right of this diagram. And if we add the waters from Greenland and from Alpine gl glaciers, they each plot quite neatly in, with just a couple overlapping examples in, in different portions of the diagram. So Antarctica here are, are waters that are rich in, um, in sulfates and chlorides and pour in magnesium and calcium. So they end up on this right side here. And it's, um, it's due to the fact that, that there's uh, mineral saturation and precipitation in these waters. These are highly concentrated waters, especially compared to the waters from Greenland and Alpine glacier systems. The Alpine glaciers, this is the kinetically limited system. So you have all these reactive surface um, minerals uh, driving the chemistry tend to be rich in sulfur and in calcium, so they end up over here. And Greenland, which has the carbonation weathering of silicates, ends up here, where you have some silicate composition that's between sodium and calcium here, and you know potassium too. And then everything is, uh, for the most part, strongly uh, rich in uh, bicarbonate. So, um, so you really actually do find my my tongue in cheek saying there's only three glaciers in the world you really do see that that with 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 a couple exceptions you have three very distinct uh, glacial regimes between um antarctica greenland and and these these alpine systems so i wanted to go beyond this a little bit um Oh, sorry, I'm not going beyond it yet. I'm going to talk about Antarctica more. Um, so Antarctica, going back to just looking at Antarctica, I'm going to focus on Antarctica for much of this talk, go back to Greenland a bit at the end. But if we look at Antarctica, um, Antarctica has a huge range of chemistry, particularly for the cations, that, that um, we range all the way from um, a sulfate rich end member here in the uh, West Antarctic ice streams, a chloride rich end member at Blood Falls, and a, and a bicarb rich end member at 
um, intricacy. So in trying to say what is the chemistry, what system is happening in Antarctica as a whole, it's very difficult to make generalizations. I mean, it's, you know, as we get more data, as we sample more lakes, I'm sure commonalities will emerge, but it's, it, it's currently a very diverse um, set of samples that we have to work with or sort of theorize off in Antarctica. So I'll work through these end members one by one, and I'll, I'll start here with Blood Falls. So this is this figure I lifted from, from Badgley et al. 2017, which was a, um, a radiology study where they, they looked at uh, subglacial conduits within taking some radar sections all through this part of Taylor Glacier. And um, uh, Badgley drew this wonderful watercolor here, which is a sketch of how the freezing front moves and the brine circulates under Taylor Glacier, which I think if, if you have the skill to do so, making a, a watercolor conceptual sketch is a, is a brilliant addition to a paper. But um, in any event, for those of you not familiar, Blood Falls is so-called because out of this crack in, in, at the terminus of Taylor Glacier, this blood red water emerges, very iron rich water, hence the color, and, and, and pours into the lake. And when you go and analyze the chemistry, and this is the work of, of Barry Lyons and others for the chemical analysis, um, you find that it's, it's nearly four times more concentrated than seawater. So this is a serious brine. This is, this is an intense um, concentration of, of, of chemical solutes. Um, there's a bit less sodium and sulfite. They're, they're, they're limited compared to other minerals such as chloride um, because they um, uh, are at mirabolite satura saturation and mirabolite is presumably precipitating out in the subglacial environment. And um, finally, while this, there might be an evaporate origin of this brine, we know that, that it it has clearly been enhanced by chemical weathering. And this is the presence of lithogenic solutes, particularly silica and iron are quite rich in this brine, although other um, more trace elements like strontium or lithium are highly enriched as well, and these have a lithogenic source. They are not abundant in evaporates or in seawater. And interestingly, the pH of this is fairly close to neutral, you might expect something so teeming in solutes to be highly acidic, but it, it's not. It, this, these are fairly neutral waters. So looking at our next end member, which are these ice stream sediments, sort of near the headwaters, if you will, of, of these Willens and, and Cam ice streams here. I, I couldn't find a picture of the core, but there's um, these are pictures of the um, sediments, um, photo micrographs of the sediments. And you can see they are chemically weathered. Um, there are little etch pits. So, so chemical weathering is actively going on in these sediments. Um, and when you look at the composition, this is the sulfate rich end member. Um, it's about a 10th of seawater. So it's about a 40th of the concentration that was seen at Blood Falls. But chloride is about a thousandth of the concentration of blood falls. So if this were to somehow evolve into a chloride rich brine through the precipitation of sulfate as, as mirabolite or as gypsum, you would have a long, long way to go to reach a blood falls type composition. Um, gypsum and aragonite are at saturation, so calcium is, is precipitating out one way or another. Um, and that at least according to Mark Skidmore, who did the analysis, that, that and, 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 and the others on the paper felt that uh, an evaporate source was excluded based on the chemistry just not matching the composition of any common evaporate minerals. And again, the pH is near neutral. So looking at our final example here, which is, um, which is Lake Untersee, particularly the most concentrated geochemistry happens in this stratified anoxic basin at the bottom of the lake, that separate it from the more the well mixed oxic waters in the rest of the lake. So these are work by Wand and others and Marsh and others. But in this bottom waters here, the conductivity here shoots up. The pH drops from highly basic to, to near neutral levels. 
and um, the composition becomes almost entirely a bicarbonate. And what seems to have happened is that these were sulfate, sulfur oxidation in the main lake, the sulfur then reduced, turned to H2S, and um, instead organic matter oxidized, and you ended up with your um, bicarbonate rich composition, solute concentration about a 50th of sea level at saturation organic matter oxidates. And again, this, this developing of this high concentration water seems to bring you down to around a neutral pH. So now this is where I'm going to go beyond looking just at, at solute chemistry here. And this is what I've been working on recently in, in, in the past couple of years, which is looking at, at, rather than looking at solutes, which are hard to get in Antarctica, I'm looking at uh, sediment instead, which is fairly easy to find. And this picture here, that's Mount Akronar. This is the Mount Akronar moraine, which is a blue ice moraine. So the way blue ice moraines form is this is usually as the ice flows past mark, um, mountain ranges and nunataks as it reaches the edges of the continents, the air is so dry, so vapor starved that there are fairly high rates of ablation at these sites. And the ablation essentially wicks away the ice. And as the ice gets trapped in, in alcoves around these nunataks, um, the, the sediments are essentially sucked up to the surface by the, the pressure of the ice and the ablating ice. So these features are fairly abundant. You know, there's hundreds of them in all parts of the continent, at least where these, um, these Nunatex and mountain ranges exist. And they're sort of a direct window into the subglacier bed. So at this site, Mount Akronar, I think it's always nice if you have an SCM to look at some of these photomicrographs. Um, you can see that these are just crusted in, in weathering products, that there's there's carbonates, amorphous material, um, clays just all over these things. And here's a bit of a, a blow up of, of some of these, these, these clay and, and other crusties that are on this material. So the weathering products are here. It's just up to us to characterize them. So this is the sampling. Um, two seasons of work were done here with myself and uh, many, many colleagues as well. Um, just particularly in the earlier season when I wasn't there, collected these. I've marked and read the samples where the sediment is freshly emerging. And um, in yellow, these have had surface exposure. So focusing on the red ones for the purposes of this talk. And um, the sampling method is really quite simple. All you need is a bucket and a shovel, ideally a chemically inert one. And you shovel it in, that's your freshly emerging sediment brought up from the ice bed interface. But you want to know how chemically altered it is. There you go, there's large cobble clasts. They might have been slightly altered, but they're not nearly as altered as the fine grained sediment. So you can compare the, the two of these and um, get a good idea of how much chemical weathering has gone on. So um, I'm going to start. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with X-ray diffraction and X-ray diffractograms, but this is just looking at clays, which are often the weathering product. So these are nice, sharp, well-formed di diagenetic clays that we find in the shales here that, are part, that make up part of the bedrock at this site. And then these are the clays we find in the subglacial sediments. So your chlorites and illites are still here but you have this massive amount of smectite clay, which is just not represented in the um, underlying rock at all, as well as some kaolinite, which is also very sparsely represented in the underlying rock. So just looking at something like this, you can see these clays are not from the rock. There are new clays forming in the subglacial environment. So we are treated this as a, a closed system because this is not an area where you have large amounts of flux, big streams winnowing the sediment. You know, this is a very small base enclosed area. So we, we, we did a, a mass balance calculation. So the, the, the way this um, plot works is um, the abundance of each of these mineral species in the igneous rock, which in this case is the Ferrar dolerite, an intrusive sill, um, is the range of values is in red, so in the case of quartz, 
Um, it, quartz abundance of igneous rock ranged between 5 and about 20%. And then the metasedimentary rock is the Beacon Formation, which it ranges from about 17 to about 40% in this case. But then the important thing was to combine all of these into an average that was weighted based on the abundance of these rocks. And then, and that's the red star. So you can, and then the black is the range of values in the freshly emerging till. So you can see in the case of quartz, the abundance of quartz and rock aligns quite well with the abundance of quartz and till. It doesn't appear as if there was much quartz loss to weathering. Um, however, for these other major rock forming minerals, this is not true at all. These three feldspar species, there's large losses in the till, especially of flagellase. And with pyroxene, there's also, you know, at least half the pyroxene has been lost in the till. So when something's lost, something else has to be gained. And what's gained is, is mostly as clays as well as amorphous products. But the, the clays, um, smectite, you know, there's some smectite in the igneous rock that may also be a weathering product, but um, but it's it's vastly more abundant in the till. Um, our two more diagenetic clays, illite and chlorite, balance approximately, and there's also a gain in kaolinite. When we look at other weathering products, um, calcite, this is about a sevenfold increase in calcite in the sediment compared to rock. None of the rocks are anywhere close to the level of calcite we found in the sediment. Um, increase in iron oxyhydroxides and hematite. Hematite is about directly comparable to the loss in magnetite, so presumably this was oxidized to that. Um, so this is an oxidizing environment which many hydrochemical studies of, of glaciers find that oxidation is a, is a key feature of, of subglacial environments. So this is a figure that puts this all together. On the top, we have the abundance of minerals in the underlying rock, including the water and gases and so forth that um, make chemical weathering possible. And then about a quarter of those weather and form either the smectite, kaolinite clays, the calcite I mentioned, uh, or, or well as a range of other amorphous um, material, particularly amorphous silica. And then um, what, what isn't found in the sediment is, is lost as dissolved solutes. And we can figure out the composition of dissolved solutes by mass balance. Um, what's needed for all of this to occur, if our assumptions of this closed subglacial environment is right, you need acids. And to get acids, you need oxygen because the acids, you either have sulfuric acid from oxidizing the sulfides, or you have organic acids from oxidizing the organic matter. There really isn't much else that's plausible in the system to do this chemical weathering. So I calculated um, that this would be about five meters of melt. And you know, this is a centimeter a year per gram of sediment to do all this much weathering through oxidation of, of the carbon and sulfur in the rock. So this, this would be a system where water flushes through the system at massively higher rates, thousands of times higher than sediment is flushed out of the system. So this sediment has been here around for a very long time, if, if these assumptions are right. But this seems like something you'd want to test. So are we sure this actually happened? Did this occur in the subglacial environment? Is there some other tracer we could use that proves that this is meltwater input? And there is cosmogenic isotopes to the rescue. So I, I don't know if everyone is familiar with this or terribly familiar with this, if, depending on your specialization, but the Earth is being constantly bombarded by um, cosmic rays, high energy particles that come from distant stars. So these are called galactic cosmic rays. And as they shoot through the, through the atmosphere, they tend to bust up um, oxygen and nitrogen, which causes these decaying chains of all these atomic, subatomic particles and create a vast range of isotopes. And one of the isotopes they create is um, tenberyllium. The tenberyllium that forms the atmosphere is known as meteoric tenberyllium. And when we get this uh, meteoric tenberyllium um, above Antarctica, it falls out with snow. 
is evicted as ice down into the subglacial environment. Once it um, melts out in the subglacial environment, um, beryllium has a property that it, it loves to sorb to the surface of solids. It doesn't, it, it doesn't like to stay floating about in liquids. So it, it will, if the, if the mineral is unweathered, we would expect the temberillium to be sorbed to the surface. But as the minerals weather, temberillium can be incorporated in silica sites and clays or as, as an oxyhydroxide or as an oxide. So, um, so the nice thing about using about a tracer in ice is that its concentration is known. It's well characterized in ice cores, which have been previously measured. And at least at this site, Mount Akradar, we're confident that there isn't a history of preglacial exposure and um, that, that the half-life of the isotope would preclude, would preclude inheritance. Um, anyway, so this here, by the way, is the work of uh, Erika Erner-Dotter, who's my, I met, my master's student, has been doing all these meteor or Ken beryllium analyses. So I definitely want to give credit to her for, for that. And um, what you're looking at here, normally temperillium is measure, measured in atoms per gram. Um, but instead of atoms, we've changed it to implied ice melt here because we know it's concentration in ice. So this is the meters of ice melt per gram, as well as the speciation into that absorbed temperillium the temperillium in oxyhydroxides and the temperillium in clays. And these are these five samples that we've analyzed so far at the site. And here on the yellow bar is that oxygen mass balance that I was telling you about earlier. So if all the O2 to create this, this sulfuric acid and carbonic acid came from ice melt, you'd expect these ranges. And then you have this meltwater tracer, the temperillium, which for the most part gives you very comparable data and further evidence of chemical weathering is that in large part it is speciated into these clays in particular. So this does seem to support this paradigm that we do have large amounts of meltwater flushing through these sediments, creating these masses of weathering products as we go. So if we go back to this Piper diagram, where does Mount Akronar fit? Um, so this is just based on mass balance. What's lost in the system is assumed to be lost to dissolved solutes. So we're mostly use, losing sodium, potassium, and magnesium, putting us about here. Not so much calcium because of all that calcite I mentioned. The calcium sticking around. It's precipitating out as a weathering product, not being lost to the dissolved solutes. This anions is far more speculative. The only thing we had to go on was the composition of the underlying rocks. And in these rocks, there's a lot more um, organic matter than there is sulfur. So that just based on that, that would put this here. And that would put us here conveniently close to the composition of the um, Lake Untersee bottom waters. But I think you know, considering the whole context of weathering in Antarctica, we can't be too certain about this as a result, particularly on the anion side, because we know that calcite is precipitating and other things may be precipitating too. And as you precipitate out um, carbonate, you're going to get richer and richer in sulfate. And eventually you'll start precipitating out sulfate and get richer, richer and richer in whatever halides are coming out as well. So this is an unknown evolution course that we can't tell from, um, from the sediments alone, or at least not terribly easily. And this too would of course evolve um, going this way towards the um, sulfite and chloride direction, but also losing calcium and magnesium as those are going to precipitate out first. Um, so I'm going to briefly uh, try to share a, a little bit of data from Greenland as well to put some broader context to the sediment tracer. So this concept of looking at sediment weathering products rather than just looking at um, water compositions. I also tried in Greenland as part of my PhD, although it didn't work quite as well there and you'll see why. Um, the sediment is of a, a very different character in Greenland. It's, um, 
much, much cleaner. You don't see these weathering crusts. And I would say this maybe is a typical grain. On the lower edge here of this grain, you see there are the kind of pockmark indications of chemical weathering, but the rest of this grain has been recently crushed by the overlying ice and is a completely fresh surface. So the, these are far, far fresher sediments than you see in, in, in Antarctica. Um, this is where I work, East Watasermia, a lovely place. Um, we took at uh, four sites, we took subglacial samples accessing the bed through hot water drill, drilling, and we also took samples at the terminus here. Um, this is a sort of synthesis figure of what we found um, with the sediment compositions down here and rock compositions up here. The thing to pay attention to would be these average compositions, average rock up here, average sediment down here. This has less silica, more mobile cations in rock than sediments, which would be typical of chemical weathering. Great. But if you look at all the elements, so the way to read this plot, this is um, if you're below this line, the sediment is depleted in this element. And if you're above this line, the sediment is enriched. So um, you, if you look at, at, at this, you see this depletion of the three mobile cation elements and enrichment in, in silica. But what you also see is depletion in aluminum, which is a, a massive red flag because aluminum is not mobile at all chemically. It, it, it's, it's usually at very, very low concentrations, hard to dissolve. Um, and what, what's going on here is that the aluminum is being depleted by physical means, that this chemical weathering system isn't closed at all. The clays, rather than crusting onto the grains, are getting flushed away because there's so much meltwater being shot through the system. And when we did look at um, clay compositions, we did find a little bit of smectite, particularly this is an interior sample from that, that borehole that was deepest in the interior. But it, um, but but there's there's just strong strong evidence that these are winnowed that this isn't the complete system. So we can't really do sediment um, tracing in the same way, or at least not in a way comparable to the method of employed in Antarctica. So one more thing about Greenland. Um, so Greenland, as I told you, everything measured in Greenland has been quite dilute. I actually got one or two samples from the boreholes that there were a little bit higher concentrations, but but it's 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 for the most part everything that's been measured has been comparable to alpine glaciers, and that you know it's 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 massively dilute. And um, so, is there anywhere where you do get more of this brine formation type weathering? Um, and I'll, I'll give you, show you some evidence, indirect evidence, that maybe might suggest that there is. And this was work by uh, my colleague Saruj Rezven Babahani, um, where he took, there were a couple of studies that novel studies to detect water at the glacial bed, the first here by Jordan and others, um, where they were looking at radio, uh, at, at bed echo intensity and as a signal of subglacial water. And they found these bed echo reflections um, in all sorts of places all around Greenland. And what Saruj did is he compared these to four different models, of the heat flux under Greenland, and modeling basically whether there was enough heat to ha have there be subglacial water there. And the way to read this figure is anywhere in red, there isn't enough heat. So if it's red, it means you need more heat for there to actually be melt. And you can see across these models, there are many regions where consistently there just isn't enough heat, particularly in the east and north. And uh, there was a similar study that actually used a different, a signal reflection method to also look for water and found water because it was a different method, different regions, had this characterization, but through much of the center of Greenland, they found evidence of water. And again, Saruj compared this to, um, to these um, heat flux models and found regions which were consistently lacking the heat to actually produce this water. 
So what I've done here is I've just mapped where these regions are. This is a bed machine map, and I've just circled the regions that, that, that have this unexplained water, or at least unexplained radar signals that are being interpreted as water. And um, also here on the geologic map of Greenland. So um, things to note about this, first of all, these, these regions tend to be at topographic highs. So um, there, the notion that this could be some intrusion of seawater just seems unlikely that the intrusion of seawater would occur where you're high up in the mountains of Greenland. And secondly, these regions span the range of major geologic terrains of Greenland. So you may well get evaporates or might well get evaporates in your Phanerozoic basins, but evaporates would be highly unlikely in your Precambrian shield as well as your volcanics. It's just not going to have evaporitic rock. Um, and how much brine concentration do you need at these sites? A lot. You know, many of these sites, the, the error, if you will, in the temperature is around negative 10 degrees. So is this even possible? What's going on here? And there would be a couple different mechanisms that could get you to this negative 10 degrees. <clears throat> One would be a cryoconcentration type mechanism where you basically take something that already has salt in it and you freeze it until that salt forms a brine. So um, if you start with seawater, it's fairly easy. You only need to freeze it about two or three times and you're already in concentrations where the freezing point is significantly depressed. Um, this is the reason why uh, the authors who have studied it are inclined to argue that that blood falls is a, um, is, is as an evaporate source, a seawater source. Um, a few saline proglacial lakes exist in Greenland in, in, in many places. So if you froze a saline proglacial lake, you'd still have to concentrate it about 100 times, which is a lot to ask out of cryoconcentration, but that might be possible. If it was the dilute fresh water we find in front of glaciers, you're, you're, you're up to thousands of times concentration. And this concentration mechanism isn't perfect. Salts are frozen on, into the ice as well. So that, that would be uh, probably impossible. But you could also create a brine by weathering. And um, this, this here, these, these trajectories are based on the abundance of salts of, no, sorry, of halides in, in major rock types. The evaporate one is, is hypothetical, but these are measured concentration of halides in, in cyanide scabros and nice from Greenland. And um, this bar here is saturated till. So this would be the somewhat idealistic situation in which you had saturated till and every single halide in that till um, went into the water. So would that happen, you would get to these freezing point depressions. It would be, uh, you know, about three or four degrees for the cyanide and less for the gabbro. But if you were able to have the fluid flow into more and more till, you could keep weathering it until you've released enough halides um, to, to um, have significant freezing point depression. So you could relate these to two different mechanisms of brine formation. If you're talking about taking some existing water and cryoconcentrating it, the model would be a frozen sediment in which the pre-existing lake or pre-existing body of seawater just becomes more and more concentrated and isolated brine pocket. The mechanism which would be more weathering based is you'd have melt in the glacial interior that would ideally have a long reactive transport course and you know many of these sites are tens to hundreds of kilometers from the interior so this is not impossible in which it's picking up halides and then you might have some cryo concentration working at the end to sort of do the finishing touch and bring you up to the um, required strength to, to cause these freezing point depressions. I would argue that this is fairly implausible in Greenland, that these at least apparent brines, if you believe the radar data, are, are so pervasive that, to, that these to be isolated pockets seems to me that, this, that the cryological 
hydrological system would connect to them over, over time. Um, and that, the, that this reactive transport mechanism picking up halides on the way seems more likely. It could also pick up some heat depending on how deep this groundwater system went. Um, so what do we know about subglacial chemistry? Hopefully we know something or, or we've talked about quite a range of things this evening. Um, so some take up points. Um, this notion of, of subglacial weathering being dilute, being with reactive, just the reactive minerals, that sediment being flushed through the system, definitely doesn't employ a um, apply to all settings. There are, are settings, uh, particularly in Antarctica, although I've argued possibly in Greenland as well, that have a very intense weathering in terms of developing intensely concentrated solutes, as well as like we saw in Mount Akronar, um, quite amount of, of chemical weathering preserved in the sediment in forms of clays and other precipitated solids. Um, and that this represents a major unknown in complexity in, in analyzing the impact of glaciers on the earth system. Like, is it these dilute systems? Is it these concentrated systems? What is the typical system? What is the major process working, I don't know, over the Laurentides history or over the Eurasian ice sheets history? You know, so these, the sort of what is the chemistry that glaciers do is still, there's, there's still, there still is a lot of complexity that we haven't quantified even in the basic question of which weathering products, how much of them, that, that we still need to, to figure out in terms of, of, of subglacial weathering. And, and finally, I think this um, looking at the sediments as well as the solutes is, is something which, which could be further explored that, that they're, you know, particularly linking to the offshore sediments there are a lot of directions where where this has not been um, as exploited as at least in, in my view it, it, it could be. So uh, let me briefly um, mention, please come back next week. We have Lauren Simpkins talking about landform evidence of persistent subglacial plumbing near grounding lines. I, I think I read the paper about this, which, which was quite interesting. So. Um, so I'd, I'd be very interested to hear this talk as well. So hopefully you can all back, um, you can all uh, hear that as well. And um, I will at this point gladly take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Joseph. Um, we'll do the usual thing of having questions indicated in the chat if that works for people. Um, so if there's any questions, for Joseph, if you just indicate that in the chat. And I'll have a look on Facebook if there's any on there too. So. I've just realized I've got my camera off. Um, so any questions for Joseph at all? Um, so Trevor, do you want to unmute yourself and um, ask, ask that directly? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a, a dust geomorphologist, so I'm quite interested in the relationship of, of limestone and and um, hydrology, the relationship between limestone and, and ice and what happens under ice sheets. So my question is, now we've got some knowledge of the chemistry of the outflows, can we begin to create maps of carbonate outcrops, geology maps of carbonate outcrops under either the Antarctic or the Greenland ice sheet? Based, based on the outflows, Oh, that would be tricky because the difficulty with carbonate is it's 
is calcite in particular can be a fairly ubiquitous mineral. Even something like your Precambrian bedrock has trace mm. amounts of calcite in it. So, and also glacier basin will capture, you know, many terrains. So the idea that, that you would be able to specifically pinpoint somewhere that's the source of the bicarbonate, I, I mean, we could, uh, you could think about it. I mean, there's, there maybe are some isotope tracers you could do to, in some cases, I, but I, I think that would be tricky. I, I, it doesn't strike me as something that would, would, be, um, would be without serious uh, difficulty just because there's, there's so many other complexities and factors involved. Yeah, okay, thanks. I mean, I guess it's such early days, really. We need to go around each continent and look at the outflows all the way around. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and like, what I, like what I showed with um, subglacial like Untersee, you, you can have an incredibly bicarbonate rich fluid which is carbonate has nothing to do with it. It was just that it trapped into this anoxic basin and under the conditions of anoxia, all the um, sulfate gave up its oxygen and oxidized organic matter. So I, in, unless there's some isotope tracer or something that is the key signature of carbonate, of, of, of mineral carbonate, of, of you know, sedimentary carbonate that you could identify then in the glacial waters, it, it, it would it would be I think there there would be just too many other mechanisms. But thank you, that's a very interesting question. Okay, thanks. And uh, Sasha has a another really interesting question. Do you want to go, unmute yourself, Sasha? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, short question is: Do you have any? Um, I was really moved by the uh, basically the uh, till slash sediment on the glacier in the beryllium ten calculations. And all of that, I was like, wow, just kind of blew me away. And the short question is, um, do you have an age model for the water that's uh, do, for, for, that's involved in this weathering? And if so, do you have, yeah, what does it include? And then I threw a couple other things like, do you have to think about um, how long it spends in the glacier versus how long it spends in some yes. glacier water? Yes, this, this is actually, this, so this work I should say is funded by the Nat National Science Foundation as part of a chemical weathering under East Antarctica project. And um, as, as someone, as I, I'll confess, as something someone does, often you put things in talks that you haven't quite polished <laughs> and aren't quite a publication oh, level. And one, yeah. of, one of the things that we put in the proposal and are planning to do is look, use uh, Nick Golage's models to uh, calculate exactly that. But this data have, do not yet include that. So it's quite possible that this um, sort of consistent difference where the 10 beryllium is just a little bit shy of, of the melt is actually could be if you corrected it for the age, age model. Oh, thanks. Uh, Tre Trevor, your mic is still on. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and so, so, so it's something we're we're planning to do and will do, and put in the proposal that we would do, but haven't done yet. So, if that's a, if that's an okay answer. Yep. <laughs> My whole life's work in progress. So yes. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. And we've got a question from Pierre Henri Ballard um, about the beryllium 10 data that, from Antarctica that you've shown. Um, he's asked, um, how do you convert these numbers in atoms per gram of sediments? How do they compare with other subglacial sediments from other places and settings? Okay. Um, well, uh, atoms per gram, yeah. I, again, I was putting a lot in the talk, uh, in the sort of more beryllium focused version. I start with an atoms per gram figure and then go to this ice melt. But the concentrations in atoms per gram and Erica, who's been working with this data, is here on the call, so she could correct me if I'm wrong. But um, but these are um, on the order of of ten to the eighth to ten to the ninth atoms per gram, which actually is not that far off from places on the Laurentide ice sheet that have. Um, been 
measured. Um, there's there's some literature. Um, actually, the best place for Laurentide values is um, uh, Greg Balko's PhD thesis, which he uh, he uh, has has all these uh, Laurentide values, and there's ones from um, from. I actually, I'm not sure if I can talk about those because I don't know if they were ever published, but there, there's other ones as well, but I, I don't know if that paper was ever published. I know it meant to be, um, but, but, in, 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 but in any event, um, post-glacial soils do have high meteoric 10 beryllium inheritance, at least in North America. I don't know of any other place they've been measured except in North America. Um, there are possible there are other possible mechanisms besides just the one I'm discussing here in Antarctica for that though. Particularly if you have sediment that's been cycled over multiple glacial cycles, you don't know for a fact that it developed its meteoric temporillium inventory in the subglacial environment, particularly in the case of the Laurentide that comes and goes. Um, we're confident that this is subglacial meteoric ten beryllium here because we're in a place that 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 has very likely been glaciated since the Miocene. Even the aggressive Pliocene models uh, don't show this deglaciating in, in the central chance at Arctic mountains because it's high elevation. Um, so so I, so it's it's. Um, a little hard to say what's the typical. I've measured, we've also measured uh, meteoric temporillium in Greenland. It's much, much lower there in the fast moving ice streams, higher um, further north where the ice isn't as active, which is a bit counterintuitive. But the concentration of, ice, of meteoric temporillium in ice in Greenland is much, much lower. So the input during the glacial period is much less. And at least in that paper, I argued that it was likely mostly inherited temporillium from the interglacial periods. So that parts of the continent that had low erosion had more temporillium and the higher erosion parts of the continent it had been stripped. So it's, it's a bit of a tricky tracer and I think it, works here in Antarctica because it's been glaciated for so long, but in the Northern Hemisphere, it's just, it, 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 it's not a clear and keen meltwater tracer, at least not in bulk total. I mean, it's something I, I, I'd like to do more work on figuring out sort of how, how to disentangle the pre-glacial signal from the meltwater signal. But but I, I I'm only especially confident that it's a meltwater signal in, in settings such as this one. Okay, thank you. We've got a question on Facebook um, asking how do you think microbial interactions could be affecting weathering processes at your Antarctic site? That's from Alicia I mean, Rutledge. Yeah, I, I I apologize for not talking very much about the microbes. This microbiology is not my specialty, but but everyone who has studied microbes in glacial settings has found that they're hugely important, uh, particularly for the oxidation reactions that seem to govern so much of subglacial weathering. You know, so like sulfur oxidation, which in almost every glacier in the world, there seems to be sulfur oxidation. It um, doesn't happen abiotically at these temperatures because all of this chemistry is happening at negative two or three degrees because of the freezing point depression under, under the weight of this ice. And you just don't have abiotic sulfur oxidation at degrees. It has to be the microbes. So, um, you know, the microbes are there, they're making it happen. All of this is a biogeochemical system and um, sort of looking as I do, just sort of at the chemical reactants and products, I, I um, you know, I leave it to my microbiological colleagues to, to look at these things and, and see the, the connections and, and the, the ecosystem sense that, that supports all of this. But I can tell you what happened from the reactants and products. It's, it's sort of the, the magic that makes it happen that the, the microbes 
are involved. And a question from Roger, um, Roger Clark. Oh yeah, just, just a very small one. Thank, thanks for your presentation, Joseph. You, you showed us a couple of slides where you were comparing to four different attempts to estimate heat flow. Yes. And um, my eye was caught by the percentages across the bottom. Of, yes. of being a seismologist, the, the seismic tomography always came out with the lowest number. So I wonder whether we'd done really well or really badly. Really badly, alas. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, th so these are the percentage of, of the, the um, heat flux of, or of the percentage of this basal water that could be explained by that heat model. So for most of them, it's around 50%. But you can see for this one, it's only <laughs> about 10%. Though it's it's better for this data set, but um, but for this one in particular, in the center, the the seismic tomography says it should all be cold, and and, and you know, so almost none of this this liquid water is explainable in the seismic tomography model. This these 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 figures are the work of of Saruj Rezvan Bebahani, um, which uh, has worked with me in developing this this notion that um, that there could be brine. In okay, green. thanks. Yeah, C, C minus, we must do better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, a question from Trevor Faulkner. Okay, I'll run um, Thanks. Wondering, because I haven't read anything about this lately, what do we know about the chemistry in Lake Vostok? Ah, uh, yes, I, I thought about putting Lake Vostok on my summary figure, but decided against it. So let's <laughs> let's zoom back. Oh, this is fine. Um, so Lake Vostok has not been directly sampled, um, but they do have samples of the Cretian ice. The Cretian ice has some salts, but the reason why I didn't decide it not to include it on this figure is because it's always hard to tell what bias there is and what actually gets exclude it versus accrete it when, when because the way salts happen is as, as the ice freezes on, brine gets trapped in pockets, which eventually then precipitates as a salt. But it's, it's very much in this part of the figure. Um, I think it would be somewhere here-ish. Uh, I don't quote me on that, but the, the concentration of salt in the accretion ice is not that high, but it's not clear if carbonates just didn't get included in that, and that's why it's so low in carbonate. So, so I, I was a little uncomfortable with that, but yes, there are probably significant sulfides and chlorides in like false Vostok, very likely that's at least somewhat saline based on what's in the accretion ice. Um, the paper that reported that argue that there were evaporates in the basin. Um, I would say that's a possibility, but um, you know, based on the ideas I've been presenting on this talk, I do not think that uh, weathering of some other halide bearing material, um, something with amphiboles or possibly feldspathic minerals such as sodalite, um, should be excluded based on the data we have so far. Thanks. Uh, is there a moratorium on actually extracting the water from Lake Vostok? Um, yeah, don't ask me any more questions. No, okay. <laughs> I mean about that. Yeah. It's, 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 it's complicated and geopolitical, but I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not the person to talk to about that. Okay, fantastic. Are we kind of out of questions there? I don't see any more on the chat and no more on um, Facebook. So I think it comes to say thank you very much uh, indeed to Joseph Grayley for that fantastic talk. And uh, I think Paco wants to can I, can say I something. Just, yeah. Can I just say, um, I'm not sure if Paco actually got my email sent earlier this hour, but uh, I would like to call upon the president of the IGS, Francisco Navarro Paco, to just say a couple of words of uh, appreciation to the tremendous uh, work that an organization <laughs> that TAVI has done. Um, 
Thank you, Paco. Uh, yes, I'm here, but I didn't notice your email. So, because I have been extremely busy just before the, this meeting. And of course, at the beginning of the talk, uh, Tavi was uh, thanking all those uh, having done presentations, all people having attended. But of course, the, the, the person deserving the most uh, acknowledgement in this case is, of course, Tavi. Tavi was the, the person who initiated this, uh, initiated, had the idea, proposed it, and then did it and maintained it. So uh, on behalf of all of the IGS people, I would like uh, Tavi to uh, thank you for, for this, congratulate, and because this has been a really big success and also a very um, important thing uh, within this uh, situation, this pandemic uh, where we are. This has been really helpful to have this, uh, all these nice talks, so much a variety of, uh, of themes, so, many, so much attendance. So I'm extremely happy and I, I would like just to say you uh, thanks on behalf of all of us. Thanks. Well, thank you, Paco. Uh, it's really appreciated, but I really do say thank you to the, to the speakers and the audience because otherwise we would never have carried on. So uh, I think we, we all deserve a big thank you for maintaining our wonderful community and enabling it to grow and strengthen even and under these difficult times. But uh, hope to see you all again next week for Lauren's talk. But uh, thank you and uh, yeah, happy yeah. first birthday to the seminar series. And thank you all so much for coming. I, I appreciate the audience. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Joseph. Yeah.